this time we'll have a special done by David Gopi. One of the coolest things I think in life is that God gives us the, the opportunity to be parents and to be fathers. And uh, I remember, you know, you're growing up and when, when things got scary as a kid, you still could know that mom and dad were there for you, right? You could run into their arms, you could, they, they'll put their arms around you and you know you felt safe. Well, we're living in a time where people are feeling unsafe. People are feeling that uh, they're nervous, they have some, some anxieties, they, they don't know what the world's gonna be like, and uh, they have every reason to feel unsafe. But God, our Heavenly Father, is there for us, and he, he has his arms open for us, and we can run into his arms, and when his arms come around us, we should feel that peace, that, that, that joy, that comfort, that safety, knowing that we're in God's hands. It's just like the, that old song that people used to sing a long time ago. He's got the whole world in his hands. Well, right now, he's got you and me and everybody in the world, and it's in his hands. So I sing this song for you about running to God, running to, to his comfort. I think about the prodigal son who ran into his father's arms, and his arms went around his son, and his son finally felt home. So think about that as I sing this song for you.
Good evening. I would like to welcome you to our evening service, wherever you are gathered around. We're so happy that you would join us, and we will study the Word of God together tonight. We've received many kind cards and comments that kind of go like this. Um, we're glad John and Sharon are back at Herman Baptist Church. So I just want to say tonight that John and Sharon are glad to be back at Herman Baptist Church. You know, that brings up um, where did John and Sharon come from? For many of us, we've not met you and, and don't know you from previous times. Uh, my grandfather came from Frankfort, Maine, and my grandmother Anderson came from New Sweden, Maine. So I'm the mixed up product of that family connection. When I was aged 10, I received Christ to be my savior. And about that time, my family started attending Herman Baptist Church. So I've attended uh, Sunday school here at Herman for many years. When I was old enough, we were able to attend the youth group. That was very special. It uh, affected my life and many others. This youth group was the evening service for Herman Baptist Church. And I can remember leading the music, giving the announcements, taking the offering, all done by the young people, the teenagers from Herman High School. And we would have special music, and then one of the teenagers would stand up and give a sermon to the fellow teenagers. So that uh, tremendous time uh, of training, I guess you'd say, because we had, um, yeah, we had a hundred or over a hundred young people coming to youth group. And uh, that manner of youth group was, um, was what we did. When I was 17, I went to NBBI for a year and uh, had a tremendous blessing there. And then that following summer, Sharon and I were married right here in Herman Baptist Church. I was 18 years old. And that wasn't a shotgun wedding. I had my eye on her since first grade. And uh, happily uh, have shared our lives together. Two weeks after our wedding, we received a call and Monroe Center Church was closed and needed a pastor. And with my youth group education and one year of MBBI, um, we went to Monroe Center Church and opened that closed church. I was 18 years old. Uh, three years we spent there. I remember the last uh, VBS, the third VBS we had, uh, we had 125 young people out for that VBS. So we saw souls saved in that ministry. At that time, I was 21, I went to, uh, we moved to Lancaster, Pennsylvania. I went to college, Lancaster Bible College, for four years. At age seven, uh, at age 25, we came back to Maine and I pastored uh, Athens Open Bible Church. We were there three years and then at age 28, we came back to Herman for a spell, uh, working in the Christian school and um, working in the Bangor area. The time came where we moved our ministry to Essex Street Baptist Church, where we served for 12 years uh, with Pastor Reynolds. And then after that, we moved to East Eddington Community Church, where we served for three years, uh, excuse me, nine years in the music ministry there. Uh, at that time, we moved to Yarmouth, Maine, and I worked in Portland for 10 years. And we became involved with uh, a church in Gorham called the Little Falls Bible Church. And I served in the music there for three years. Finally, we made it back to Herman Baptist Church. And we are here, age 70. <laughs> so 
Now uh, God is blessing us in this chapter of our lives. Our theme for tonight will be the human heart. Um, there's reasons why we would want to study the human heart, but just remember, it's not the blood pump heart. It is what the Bible calls the human heart. This being the, the innermost part of who you are and who I am. Every man, woman, boy, and girl has this human heart. This human heart has been had many songs written about. I'm thinking of us, uh, one you may know. In my heart, there rings a melody. Uh, some more uh, other, un more unfamiliar hymns might be Jesus, the joy of the loving heart. There is healing for the humbled heart. This is the heart that lovers talk about when they say, I love you with all of my heart. This is the heart the Bible talks about when it says, we serve and worship our God with a broken and contrite heart. Tonight we'd like to explore what the Apostle Paul is talking about regarding the human heart. You know, I, I looked it up. There's over a hundred passages in the Bible that speak of the human heart. Uh, let, me, let me give you a few of these passages. As a matter of fact, let's do it together. I'll read the passage, and when it comes time to say the word heart, I'm going to ask you to join and say heart. Uh, I'll just let you have it so that... Uh, that part of the passage. Psalm 51.10, David says, Create in me a clean... Well, not bad. Let's try that again. I think you could do better. David said, Create in me a clean... Yeah, much better. Uh, thank you for your participation. Proverbs 4.23 Keep your, yep, yeah, with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Mark 12.30, love the Lord your God with all your, yes, thank you. Proverbs 23.19, my son, be wise and guard thine a great passage on the heart. Psalms 14, 1, the fool has said in his, there is no God. Thank you. Proverbs 3, 5, trust in the Lord with all thine, no surprise there. Thank you. Psalms 24, 4, he who has clean hands and a pure Heart. Thank you. Matthew 9, 4. Jesus knew their hearts, and he said, Why do you think evil in your... Yes. Thank you. Matthew 6, 21. Where your treasure is, there your... is also. Very good. Thank you for your participation. Those are some great passages. And uh, I thank you for sharing the word heart. Why study this subject at all? Why should we care what the Bible says about the heart? Well, if you turn in your Bibles, and I hope you have them with you today as we gather to chapter 7 of Romans we begin to see the Apostle Paul lay out for us a problem. A problem that's related to the human heart. We'll call this the Christian dilemma. And just before we break God's word open, shall we bow in prayer. 
Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight for the majesty and the magnificence of our great God. We thank you, God, for the way that you have drawn us to yourself. And it's with great gratitude that you have supplied our every need. We're just thanking you tonight, God, for what a privilege it is that we could gather around your word in our homes, in our lives. And as we gather here tonight in your word, may it, may it be a blessing to us. Help me to bring words of encouragement to this matter of the human heart. May we understand Paul's efforts to clarify meanings regarding the human heart. And Lord, on this Mother's Day, help us not to forget memories. Memories that this church means to us for all of our mothers who have passed and memories, Lord, of your work in this place. So bless our waiting hearts, O God, tonight as we open your word at this time. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. I would like to read Romans 7, verses 14 through 25, to answer the question, why should we study the human heart. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. For the good that I will to do I do not do. But the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Now if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin." Romans chapter 7. Why should we study the human heart? According to the Apostle Paul, there's a problem. If Paul was living today, he would say, Houston, we've got a problem. Paul is not saying he doesn't know the answer to the problem. He is giving us the problem because the Lord has shared with him what the answer is. And we're going to go into chapter 8 tonight and go down through those first verses of chapter 8 as we look at Paul's answer to this problem. We've gone on personal visitation. Uh, Mike Martin, if you're listening, you will verify this. When we go to people who have not contemplated their sinfulness, uh, often I've heard people say, well, I'm bad, but I'm not that bad. One, one lady said, well, I sin, but I would never sin on purpose. I remember one night when Mike asked that question, um, the person said, well, I, I know I sin, 
but I don't really mean to do it. And uh, thus we, we have some responses to the human condition. If you've accepted Christ into your heart, I'd like to ask you a question about your heart. With your permission, do you have a cold, hard heart? Or do you have a soft and loving heart? Do you have a hateful and bitter heart? Or do you have a giving heart? Do you have a fleshy heart? Or do you have a spiritual heart? Do you have a self-centered heart? Or do you have a God-centered heart? Now, it's not fair for me to ask these questions because actually we, we all have both of these situations in our heart. You see, we have an inner person, an inner man. We have one heart but we have two natures. Paul is presenting us with both natures and explains the condition we face. In our old sinful nature, there can be coldness and hardness of heart. But in our new nature, we evidence a tenderness, soft and loving towards God and his work that we never knew before. I was in uh, Northern Maine some time ago, and there was an ungodly farmer in the particular town up there that had actually received quite a revival in their town through the local church. This ungodly farmer was known in the community for beating his cows. And not only did he have the reputation of beating his cows, but he also used profanity with his cows when he spoke to each one of them. And uh, one day, this hard-hearted, ungodly farmer got down on his knees and received Christ as his Savior. A revival just kind of swept through that town at that time. Before nightfall, the farmer, rejoicing in his newfound salvation, feeling the glory of the Lord shining in his heart, he went out into the barn and he spoke to each one of his cows. They were kind of personal to him. He asked the cows to forgive him. And he made a promise to each cow that he would never beat them again. And that he would never use profanity again with each one of those cows. He had experienced the new nature in his life upon receiving Christ. And so it is with us. Even though we do have the old nature, we do have a new nature. And for some of us, that's a conflict. These natures do war against each other. Quite often when there's a gruesome crime uh, reported in the headlines and you pick up the news and it says how many were killed by one person. I have said each time I read this, how, how can that be? Why would someone do such a gruesome thing? What makes a person kill several people needlessly? Uh, I want you to listen to my answer. I want you to listen closely. 
every gruesome crime has happened in the human heart before the trigger was pulled. Every robbery was concocted in the human heart before it was executed. Every cheat, every deception has taken place in the human heart before it was done to somebody else. Why, we could even make personal application. Every bad word we've ever said about our neighbor, about somebody else's wrongs, has come from within our heart. God's in the business of changing hearts. He is a heart-changing God. His mission in your life and mine is to change our heart. And when the heart gets changed, when we get changed inwardly in our heart, our life is changed outwardly in our life. Second reason I'd like to study the human heart is because I've listened to a lot of sermons in 70 years. I've heard sermons talk about we ought to be stronger, we ought to try harder, we should be better. Well, just go do it. Here's the word of God, just go do it. And we go home from these sermons and honestly, little if nothing ever changes. We never get the tools out of the toolbox. God would have us to be victorious. But we never seem to get there. Nothing ever changes. I remember riding with our college choir going on a concert tour. We were riding in a bus across western Pennsylvania I guess we were headed for Wheeling, West Virginia or beyond. And as I was praying that day, riding in that bus, it seemed like God came to my heart and spoke so clearly. And he revealed to me that day that I, I was losing the conflicts. In my Christian life, every battle I had, I was losing. I was not winning. There was no victory in my Christian life. I realized that I needed a change to happen in my life. And that change needed to happen in my heart. How is your heart? How are the things in the change department? We smile and people believe we must be okay. But it's only the power of God that can give us the victory. Just real quickly, the third reason I want to study the human heart tonight was because we're living in a time of human history in the making. You know, I will never forget 2020, will you? I won't be able to tell you what happened in 2019, but I will be able to tell you what happened in 2020. The year that decisions had to be made, tough decisions. Matter of fact, right now, there are people making decisions that affect how we worship, how we shop, where we go, and things pertaining to our future. Friends, we are living in a time when our heart needs to be right so that we would have the right response. 
How have you responded to the pandemic world? Has our response been in faith, believing God? Or have we been doubting God? Has our response been in calm assurance? Or have we been worrying just a bit? Has our response been in strong belief that God is not out of control? Or have we been in a little despair, a little desperation? Our heart has the ability to doubt, to worry, and to despair. But this is not the time for these. This is the time for our heart to be right with God. So we would like to turn to Romans chapter 8. We're going to start with verse 1. And look at the scripture that Paul addresses the problem from Romans chapter 7. Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. God wants you and I to be victorious. Back in Romans chapter 5, verse 16, it says condemnation was the result of sin. Have you ever felt what it's like to be condemned? Before we received Christ, we were, we were condemned. We were on death row, if you want to put it that way. I was 10 years old, and the Lord revealed in his word to me that I, I had been proven guilty. In that condemnation, there was no way out. As I, as a pers unsaved person, was on death row, parole was not even an option. Harsh? Yeah. But that's just what the Bible says about it. Now he says, to all of you who are on death row, all of you who are disqualified, all of you who had no hope for heaven, because you have Christ now, there is no condemnation. Christ is talk Paul is talking to the Christians at Rome. One of the questions that comes up here is, what about Christians who sin? Well, if we were all here, we could all raise our hands. What's the answer to that? No condemnation. Well, I know some Christians that have done some pretty bad things, bad sins. What about that? Well, that's all of us. No condemnation. Christ alone offers us freedom from the death penalty. He does it by offering us a new power, the power to do his will. This is what the Apostle Paul is going to treat now in these first few verses of Romans chapter 8. You know, some, sometimes we read the Bible and it really doesn't make sense. This is one of those passages. Difficult to understand. Is he talking about a position? Or is he talking about our salvation? Or is he talking about... Well, I'll tell you what he's talking about. We're, we're going to look at it in verse 2. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Now, now, friends, there's power in this verse. 
you got to know about this power. You know, I, I, we've, all, we've talked about it and we've thought about it, you know, about God providing for us sins and the power to not sin. And, you know, it's one thing to know about his power by faith. But in this passage, he's talking about us knowing experientially when we walk in the Spirit, we walk free from the power of sin and the old nature. Because the very power of God makes sin powerless over us. You know, when uh, death row people leave prison, I'm told they go out many times and commit the same crime over again. They're called a repeat offender. Our system of justice says those guys are going back to jail. God's system does not say that. God is going to give us the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, making us free from the law of sin and death. Verse three. The law is unable to give us victory, so God did something that the law never could do. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. Before Christ, there was really no power over sin. You could say that the law was unable, unable to give you victory. My dear Christian friend, have you ever felt unable to have victory over sin. That's a human reality. But when the power of God came, that did it. God made provision to end sin's control over us. So as we turn now to Think of this and how this all works and how we're, we're supposed to experience God's power. The apostle is making it very clear that it's a human impossibility for you and I to get victory over our old sin nature. We do not get victory over our old sin nature by trying harder. We do not put it to rest by being stronger. No, it's a human impossibility. And the Apostle Paul now is going to talk to us about the power that is greater than we could ever conceive. It's kind of like the answer was written in the lines of a song that I sang just two weeks ago on Sunday morning. It goes like this. So here is all my praise expressed with all my heart offered to the friend who took my place. God did what the law could never do. We were on death row, judged guilty, and he took our place. He gave us his son in a body that could be sacrificed for our sins. Now in verse 4, we do not have to follow after the flesh, but now we can follow after the Spirit. Verse 4 of Romans 8, that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. When we walk in fellowship 
with the Holy Spirit. That's our new nature. Walking in our new nature. Walking in the Spirit. We do not follow the old sinful nature. So we were on death row with no way out and no hope, and he steps in, and he takes our place. When we were born to this world, the Bible says we were called the old man. What is an old man? And don't talk about my dad. Just, what is the old man? When the Bible says, yep, he's the old man, what does that mean? Well, it doesn't mean the old sin nature. That's that's something different. The old man has exactly this. The old man has an old sin nature. But the old man cannot please God The old man does not seek God. And the old man does not understand God. As a matter of fact, in addition to an old nature, the old man, as we if we do a study on this, has an old mind. The old man has an old will. And the old man has an old set of emotions. I heard Billy Graham speak just the other day, and he said, the heart has a disease. It's the disease called sin. We've been blessed with a two-year-old, little fella. Uh, I guess I would call him a great-great-grandson. And this little guy is an old man. If you say... Eli, don't step in the water. I can guarantee you he's going to step in the water and soak his shoes. If you say to Eli, don't step on the grass, immediately he's going to step on the grass. It's almost like when you say no, that, that's his signal that he, he's got to break that. Our human nature is that way. I was down in New Hampshire recently and we stayed at a rather nice um, motel. It, It was old pilgrim pioneer style. And there were signs up everywhere that said, wet paint. Do not touch. And there was something in me. I know what it is. I'm just telling you about it. I had to go touch to see if the paint was wet. When we become a Christian, the Bible says, now we're called the new man. What's a new man? A new man has an old nature and a new nature. The new man has the old mind and the new mind. Added to this person, there is a capacity to understand God. The new man can actually please God, can seek God. Verse 5. It's not what you think. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. I like the way the New Living Translation worded this particular passage. It said, those who are dominated by the sinful nature mind the things of the flesh. Those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit 
mind the things of God's spirit. So you see, there's a, there's a war brewing here. Our sinful nature dominates. And the Holy Spirit comes in to control. So if you're like me and you've been trying to break the domination of the old nature and haven't been too successful at it, by the way, old habits are hard to break. What we're missing is the fact that the Holy Spirit wants to come in and control us by his spirit in the new nature and put the old nature to death. How does it work? How does he do this? Well, the old nature works on desire. We do what we desire to do. Some people say, well, I didn't do that on purpose. Oh, really? We should say, oh God, I did it because I wanted to. Well, how about the Holy Spirit? Oh yeah, it still desires. And the Holy Spirit puts in us new desires. Empowered by God. Informed by the word of God. And those new desires come up and bring new life. And he overpowers and puts to death our old nature. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 is talking about the wood, hay, and stubble and the gold, silver, and precious stone. The reward of the flesh, the old sinful nature, is death and loss. Wood, hay, and stubble. But the reward of the spirit is life. Gold, silver, and precious stone. So I'm going to ask you a question. How much time do you spend in the Spirit? How much time do I spend stomping around in the old nature, keeping old things alive, judging, measuring, trying to improve? You see, Wood, hay, and stubble is most of our life. But praise God for those moments when we're walking in fellowship with the Spirit of God and we have gold, silver, and precious stone as our reward. Verse 6. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritual minded is life and peace. When we were born, we just had the old nature. We were carnal-minded people. And we learned new facts from day one about our world, about how things go, what the rules were, how your parents wanted to train you. But then when we were born again, that new capacity to understand spiritual things came onto us. And we began to add spiritual truths to our inventory of what we knew. When I received Christ in 1960, I was at age 10, my new nature and my new mind became active. Some people would wonder, how is it possible to be putting the old sinful nature to death? Well, I want to make sure we cover all the verses, so we're going to move quickly. Verse 7, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, 
for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh, verse 8, cannot please God. I just want to make a mention here that the, the old nature can never please God. And it never will. It is hostile to God. Oh, we can wash it and scrub it and polish it and dress it up and try to let everybody, our friends, know that we're okay. But it never pleases God. Old sinful nature in control of our life cannot please God. New nature in control of your life, the Spirit lives within you. It brings death to the old. Verses 10 and 11. We just read them as we move towards our close. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. Verse 11. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give to you mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Verse 12. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh, but we live to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. I have one line in my notes. It says, there is no obligation. We have no obligation to the old self. No obligation. Why do I feel so obliged to my old sin nature? There's a passage, there's two passages in closing. One passage is verse 14. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. I remember the day after I received Christ into my heart, I came to my mother and said, Mom, I don't feel saved today. Am I really saved? I can't tell you how many times that question has come up in my life. Well, I, I don't feel godly today. I, I don't feel, am I really saved? And boy, what a passage when it says, verse 14, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God these are sons of God. And how many times the Spirit has reassured my heart that the Spirit of God is still at work in my life, making me conscious of sin, leading in ways that humans shouldn't know about. His ways are so great. I rest my case on that passage Every time the pop quiz comes up and I'm asked that question, are you sure you're saved? <clears throat> what, the, what can I say that would make a difference in your life as we come to the end of this passage that the Apostle Paul speaks of? I want to say two things. We need to be in fellowship with the Holy Spirit, but I, I wonder what, what breaks our fellowship? What causes our fellowship with the Holy Spirit to be broken? As the Bible says, grieving the Holy Spirit. Well, let's, be, let's keep it simple. Sin. Sin can break my fellowship. And somebody said, well, unconfessed sin. Yeah, that, that adds to it, and that's definitely true. So what can I do to restore 
my fellowship to the Holy Spirit when it's broken. That's right. I'm going to confess my sin to the Lord and restore the right relationship. Put myself back into fellowship with the Spirit of God so my life will produce gold, silver, and precious stone. Now, this all comes together in Colossians chapter 3, verse 17, where it says, Whatever we do in word or deed, do all to the glory of God. Do you realize that if you will walk in fellowship with the Holy Spirit of God, walk in the Spirit, Whatever you do in word or deed can bring glory to God the Father. I've got a long, long history of being in the dishpan. But you know, if I'm walking with the Lord in the right fellowship, all my hours in the dishpan can bring glory to Him. You know, when you sweep the floor, it can bring glory to God the Father. Whatever you do, if you go to your job and you're in fellowship with the Lord, you can bring glory to God the Father. And not only in deeds, but in word. In word or deed, bring glory to the Lord. I'm going to leave you with this. God has a plan. He has a plan for holy lives. He wants to change us from the inside out. And the, the benefit or the effect that I think of often is that God will transform my life so that these, these old wicked hands become holy hands. My wayward eyes will become watchful eyes for his work. My wandering feet will become working feet for the kingdom of God. The words of my tongue will become kind words of grace and mercy. And yes, even my mind will be transformed into the mind of Christ. God has a plan for us to be holy people. All to the glory of God. Shall we bow in closing prayer? God, we bow at this time, this time in our world, this time in our lives. Lord, we, we've never been privy to the future but we believe it's very possible that there's the soon return of Christ that will happen. That you are actually drawing us out and preparing us in a way that we never would have dreamed to make us holy people, transformed people, victorious Christians who know and experience the power of the Holy Spirit of God as we walk in his fellowship day by day. So keep our hearts, Lord. Keep us strong. Keep us trusting and believing. And we'll praise you and thank you and give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen.
runs deep Your grace is more Where grace is found Is where you are And where you are Lord, I am free Holiness is Christ in me Oh God, how I need 